Hello guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're gonna to be talking about the case of Annie Lay. Annie Lay was a pharmacology student at Yale University when she was violently murdered in a research building on campus. I first heard about this case a couple of years ago on Forensic Files. Let me know if any of you are obsessed with that show like I am. And it fascinated me because one, the forensic evidence played a huge role in this case. And two, the fact that something like this could happen in a building with such tight security is really shocking. Anyway, let's get into it. Annie Marie Lay was born in San Jose, California in 1985 and grew up in a large Vietnamese American family. Annie was known to have a great sense of humor and was said to be friendly to everyone she met. One thing to know about Annie is that she was very, very smart and a really hardworking student. She was the valedictorian of her graduating high school class and was actually voted most likely to be the next Einstein by her classmates. After high school, she received $160,000 in scholarships and got her undergraduate degree majoring in cell developmental biology and minoring in medical anthropology from the University of Rochester in upstate New York. And this is where Annie met Jonathan Wadowski. Annie and Jonathan were said to be perfect for each other. They fell in love quickly and Annie described him as her best friend. Friend. After a few years of dating, Jonathan proposed to Annie and they were to be married on September 13th, 2009. After graduating from the University of Rochester, Annie went on to study pharmacology at the very prestigious Ivy League school, Yale University. She was very successful at Yale with her research having implications for treatments of cancer, diabetes, and muscular dystrophy. And this is one of the things that makes this case so unbelievably sad is that Annie did really important work and she wanted to potentially change lives with her research and her line of work. By 2009, Annie was 24 years old and completing her final year at Yale. She and Jonathan were actually living apart at the time as he was attending Columbia University in New York, completing his own doctorate degree in physics and mathematics. They both anxiously awaited their big day and were looking forward to their honeymoon in Greece that would follow. On September 8th, 2009, their wedding was only five days away and Annie was very excited but also pretty nervous because she had been planning this wedding for months and months and she wanted the day to be perfect. That morning, Annie left her off-campus apartment and headed to campus, which would be her last day at school for the next couple weeks, as the following day, she would be leaving for Long Island, which is where she was having her wedding. Annie dropped her purse, cell phone, credit cards, and cash off at her office, which was in the Sterling Hall of Medicine. Then at about 10 a.m., she walked from her office in Sterling Hall to another building on campus, at 10 Amistad Street, which was where her research lab was located. The day soon passed by and by 9 p.m., Annie hadn't returned home. Her roommates started to get really worried because they were expecting her to be home by then. She almost never stayed late on campus and they actually weren't able to get a hold of her. Annie was said to be very responsible in terms of her own personal safety. In fact, she actually wrote an article for the Yale Student Magazine about how to stay safe on campus. So with all of that, her roommate decided to go ahead and call the New Haven police to report her missing. The police first went to Annie's office where they discovered her purse and other belongings she had left there earlier that morning and they saw this as an indication that she was likely still on campus. Retracing her steps, police then started to narrow in on her research lab. Annie can be seen on the lab's security camera entering the building at 10 a.m. and nothing seems to be out of the ordinary in the footage. Her Yale ID card was used to swipe into lab G13 on the basement floor of the building that morning. But what was odd and what stood out to police is after reviewing the security footage, Annie couldn't be seen leaving 10 Amstead Street that day. There was only one security camera on the basement floor and Annie wasn't seen in any of that footage either. At 12.50 p.m. that day, the fire alarm in the building went off 
and all the staff and students were forced to exit the building. It wasn't long before the building was cleared and all staff and students were allowed back into the building. Very early on in the investigation, a witness named Raymond Clark III came forward with some information. Raymond was in 10 Amistad Street the day Annie disappeared. He wasn't a Yale student, but was the lab technician who had worked in the building since 2004 and he was in charge of cleaning the labs and cleaning the mouse cages. He told police he had seen Annie in room G13 that morning, but she left when the fire alarm went off. But police combed over the security footage dozens of times looking for Annie, but she couldn't be seen leaving the building during the alarm. Since there was no evidence that Annie had left the building that day, the police closed down the whole building for investigation. The entire building was searched from top to bottom, with police checking every lab, hallway, and closet. They also sifted through the building's garbage bins, but nothing was found to suggest where Annie possibly went or what had happened to her. The day after she disappeared, Annie's family flew in and so did her fiance so they could assist in the investigation. Annie's disappearance started gaining a lot of media attention quickly because it was very very mysterious. And it wasn't long before the Connecticut State Police and the FBI got involved in the investigation because of the high profile nature of the case. At the start, authorities weren't sure if they were dealing with foul play or maybe a runaway bride. Due to the fact that Annie's wedding was only a couple days away from when she disappeared, police considered the possibility she just got cold feet before her wedding and took off. But through interviews, police learned Annie had been very excited for her wedding and she had been planning it for months. She never mentioned even once that she was having second thoughts and her friends told police she loved Jonathan more than anything and that she just, she wouldn't do that. And after speaking with friends and family and the fact that there was no evidence she even left the building that day, this was quickly ruled out. It was really mysterious and everybody who was following the case was just stunned that she could go missing in the middle of the day from a very secure building on campus. Smart pretty and conscientious. That's how friends describe Annie Lee. A lot of good friends, a wonderful fiance she's going to marry on Sunday. We all love her a lot. Photos of the 24 year old Yale medical student on Facebook show the bride to be smiling, posing in her wedding dress and with her fiance, who she describes as her best friend. But now police are focusing on another picture, this one, which may be the last photo taken of Annie. Surveillance cameras capturing the petite medical student Tuesday morning as she entered the Yale lab where she worked, disappearing later that day without a trace and without her things. She left her pocketbook, her cell phone, everything in the lab. Lee was supposed to marry her fiance, Jonathan Wadowski, a graduate student at Columbia this weekend in New York. He's an amazing kid, wonderful, wonderful boy. And he just must be so heartbroken, I just cannot imagine. Thursday, investigators combed over the lab. Later, sorting through dumpsters, looking for clues. Co-workers uh, can't understand how she disappeared in the middle of the day. Uh, Look at all the people, how could that happen? She has a little tiny thing, but still, I mean, it's amazing. It really is, it's pretty scary. We're just praying that she's just gonna pop up somewhere and everything's okay. We're not gonna look at the worst here. Then on September 12th, three days after her disappearance, police went back to 10 Amistad Street to conduct a second search of the building. It was then that they found blood spatter, as well as beads that looked to be from Annie's necklace in the lab she was in that day, which was room G13. During the search of that room, an officer also lifted up one of the ceiling tiles and found a sock and a blue rubber glove stuffed in the ceiling. Both items had blood on them. Luminol was sprayed in the room, which uncovered a very bloody crime scene that had been cleaned up. While they were searching, police started to pick up on the very distinct smell of human decomposition, but they couldn't tell exactly where in the building it was coming from. The following day, September 13th, 2009, cadaver dogs were brought in, and it was then that Annie's body was found stuffed inside a wall behind a cable chase in the basement. This was a devastating end to the five day search and most heartbreaking of all is the day her body was found was the day that she was supposed to be getting married. 
Good morning, Maggie. It was the discovery that everyone dreaded after an exhaustive search using sniffer dogs and high-tech equipment. Last night, authorities announced they had found remains. And even before they had made positive identification, they say they believe it is indeed the body of 24-year-old Annie Lay. Five days after Annie Lay vanished, state police found a body in the building where she was last seen alive. Shortly after police made the announcement, Yale's president offered his condolences. Our hearts go out to the family of Annie Lee, to her fiancé, to her friends, the family and fiancé and friends now must suffer the additional ordeal of waiting for the body to be positively identified. The discovery stunned students who had held out hope until the end. Uh, I mean, I, you know, really tried to remain as hopeful as possible throughout. Um, I certainly didn't think it would uh, end in the way that it did. Um, I think uh, it's um, just in incredibly gruesome. The discovery came on the same day Lee had been scheduled to be married on Long Island, New York, to her college sweetheart, Jonathan Wadowski such a tragic ending. The focus now obviously finding the person responsible. Police would not say whether they have any prime suspects. Meanwhile, we are told that the only people who have access to the area of the building where the body was found are those with Yale University identification. The Connecticut Medical Examiner's autopsy found that Annie had died as a result of traumatic asphyxia due to neck compressions, meaning that she was strangled to death. She had a broken jaw and collarbone, injuries that had occurred while she was still alive. So it was a very violent attack. She had many other broken bones, which were caused when she was stuffed into this small opening in the wall, which is just awful. I don't know how someone can do that to another human being. There were also signs that she had been sexually assaulted, but the medical examiner couldn't say for certain that she was. It was at least attempted. Her Yale ID card and a blue rubber glove matching the one found in the ceiling were found with her body. DNA samples were taken from her clothes and the area surrounding her body and were sent off to a lab for comparison against the national DNA database called CODIS. On the evening of September 14th, a candlelight vigil was held for Annie on campus. Hundreds of students and staff members attended to say goodbye to one of their own. Many friends and classmates and professors spoke out about Annie's character, and everybody was just devastated by this loss of such a promising life. Her roommate described the murder as completely senseless, and it definitely was. As the Yale community anxiously awaited updates on the investigation, classes actually resumed the next day, and a history professor described the day as the saddest day to go to class since the 9-11 attacks in 2001. Yale publicly mourned Annie's death. They made grief counselors available to students and assured them that safety and security was a top priority on campus. The dean of Yale upped the security around campus and bike patrol presence was increased as well. The entire campus was on edge, not only because Annie's killer was still at large, but that it most likely was someone from the Yale community, since the building and the room that she was found could only be accessed by the Yale ID cards. Due to the high security measures in the building, authorities and Yale officials maintained that it would be extremely difficult for someone without a Yale ID card to enter the basement laboratory, leading them to focus their investigation on Yale employees and students. Given this, Annie's fiance was quickly ruled out as a suspect. He was also at Columbia University at the time, and all the evidence pointed to that it had to be someone who had access to the room where the murder took place which was room G13. This only made the fear on campus even worse, with people being afraid to even be on campus at all, knowing that a killer could just be walking around on campus. Police soon got a hit on the DNA samples taken from the area around Annie's body, but it was not the answer they were expecting. The DNA matched a man named Kieran Robinson, and he was a convicted felon, but 
Something definitely wasn't adding up because he had actually died years before Annie's murder. Turns out his DNA being at the crime scene could be easily explained. He had actually worked in construction and had worked in that particular room years before his death, which is just crazy, the power of forensics. And it's wild that his DNA was preserved for many years you know, behind that wall. Unfortunately, there were no other matches from the CODIS database, which kind of left police at a dead end on that front. After a couple more days had passed, police interviewed over a hundred people, watched footage from over 75 different security cameras on campus with no luck. Police determined that there were only three people who accessed room G13 on the day that Annie was murdered. One was Annie, obviously to what was a contractor who was doing work on the building, but he was quickly ruled out. The third was a man who had been on police's radar since almost the very beginning. And that was 24 year old Raymond Clark, the lab technician who claimed to see Annie leaving the building during the fire alarm. When he made this claim, police were suspicious right away because they had already combed through all that footage and knew 100% she didn't exit the building during the fire alarm. Raymond was said to be a total control freak in the lab and would be pretty aggressive and rude to any students who left the lab messy or out of order. Police discovered that Raymond once sent Annie texts in the past, scolding her for leaving a mess in the lab and in the text messages, he suggested they meet up to discuss the lab rules. But others said that Raymond was a nice and friendly guy. He was also engaged to be married at the time of Annie's murder. He had no criminal record or any any kind of run-ins with authorities at Yale either. Raymond clocked in around 8 a.m. that morning and he can be seen on various security cameras around the building. He was captured leaving the building during the fire alarm and you can see he's wearing blue scrubs. But a few hours later, he was captured on the basement security camera wearing different scrubs. He clocked out just after 4 p.m. that day and police believe that he killed Annie in room G13 sometime before the fire alarm took place. After the fire alarm, he returned to room G13, cleaned up and changed his scrubs. The key card data showed that Raymond went into G13 over 50 times that day, probably going back and forth, cleaning things up and making sure he didn't miss anything. At one point that day, Raymond was captured sitting on some steps on campus with his head in his hands. When police brought him in for questioning, he had various scratches on his arms and face, along with a couple of bruises. He explained that a cat made the scratches. He was also given a polygraph test, which he failed, but as we know, polygraph tests aren't the most reliable. So with not much more to hold him on, he was released at 3 a.m. in the morning but not without police getting a DNA sample from him, which he provided willingly. They swabbed underneath his fingernails and inside his mouth. The following morning on September 17th, 2009, police got word that Raymond Clark's DNA was a match to the DNA pulled from Annie's clothes. And he was then arrested by the FBI at a motel where he was staying with his father. <laughs> Authorities got the green light shortly after 8 this morning. Immediately, barricades went up on the highway in front of the motel, and a team of FBI agents raced up the back stairs straight to room 214. There they found Raymond Clark in a white shirt, tan pants, and soon he was wearing handcuffs. Hidden behind tinted windows, he was brought into the New Haven Police Department. Hey, big man. Enjoy jail. A few minutes ago, Raymond J. Clark III, 24 years of age of Middleton, Connecticut, was arrested in a, at a motel in Commonwealth, Connecticut. And then, just two hours after Clark's arrest... All right, this is number 15, Raymond Clark. Uh, he was arraigned in court in the murder of Annie Lay. When asked if his rights had been read to him, he said clearly, yes. The evidence was just overwhelming. They soon found the scrubs he was wearing that day, and they had Annie's blood on them. The logbook showed that Raymond had signed in that morning with a green pen, 
and a green pen was found with Annie's body inside the wall. He was no doubt on the crime scene that day. He was one of the only people that accessed the room that day. He got his DNA on her clothes. Her DNA was on his clothes. There was even blood found on his boots and they tracked him through the surveillance footage. It was a very solid case evidence wise. The footage of him with his head in his hands on that day is just so eerie. That my friends is a guilty man. The physical evidence was just so, so strong in this case. Good morning, Julie. 24 year old Raymond Clark III woke up this morning in a high security prison about an hour north of here. He was arrested yesterday in the death of 24 year old Annie Lay. Clark was picked up at a motel where he spent his last night before his arrest dining on pizza. New details are also emerging about the man authorities believe savagely strangled Yale graduate student Annie Lay before stuffing her body behind a wall. The Hartford Current reports evidence found in the ceiling and crawl space where the body was discovered contained her DNA and Clark's. Today's New York Daily News says Clark's lab boots have Lay's blood on them and that he may have dropped his signature green pen into a crevice, then brought fishing hooks and wire to work, possibly to retrieve the pen. This is not about urban crime, it's not about university crime, it's not about domestic crime, but an issue of workplace violence. Because the physical evidence was so strong in this case, police didn't really need to establish a motive. So that kind of still remains a mystery to this day, unfortunately. Investigators were able to confirm that the two of them in no way ever had any kind of romantic relationship. All they could really find was on the day of her murder, Annie had sent out a mass email to everybody in the building explaining that she was getting married on the 13th and would be away for a couple weeks on her honeymoon. And they could see that Raymond opened that email. Police speculated that maybe Raymond had some kind of crush on Annie, and this email led to a jealous fit of rage, but nothing of the sort could be confirmed. Annie's friend suggested that maybe the article she had written about campus safety was somehow connected to this. She said, the only thing I can possibly think of right now is maybe a psychopath, an antisocial person who, I don't know, maybe got upset about what she wrote back in February about not being safe. The fact that she wrote about safety on campus to later be murdered on campus is very unnerving and a really crazy coincidence that you kind of have to wonder if that played any kind of role in this case. Raymond's former high school girlfriend soon spoke out about him, saying that he was extremely controlling. He would tell her what clothes she could wear, where she could go, and what friends she could have. She also said he would get very angry and physical with her to the point where she was frightened. Annie was laid to rest on September 24th and her funeral was broadcasted on TV. Her family and friends gave emotional speeches speaking to what a tenacious and warm person she was. The audience heard stories about her academic success, sense of humor, and ambition. Her fiance's mother recalled Annie's love for animals who once rescued a group of abandoned kittens in Long Island and took one of them back by train to her home in New Haven. Her friends spoke about how perfect Jonathan and Annie were for each other, and Jonathan did receive lots of support. I can't even imagine the pain of that kind of loss. So close to what was supposed to be the best day of their lives is truly heartbreaking. Wedding gifts were left outside of Jonathan's home, and on the day of her funeral, he actually wore the wedding ring that Annie would have given him. Despite initially intending to plead not guilty to the charges, Raymond Clark changed his plea to guilty to the murder of Annie Lay. He was also charged with attempted sexual assault that ended in an Alford plea, which is when the defendant accepts that there's enough evidence to convict them of the crime, but they don't actually admit to the crime. His sentencing was held 18 months after he was first arrested, with his father and his fiance present while Raymond received a sentence of 44 years in prison for the murder of Annie Lay. Good afternoon, Keith. Raymond Clark arrived here at New Haven Superior Court just before 9.30 this morning. He, the sentencing is going on as we speak and we are expecting to hear from Raymond Clark the first time he's made any public comments about all of this. And the 26-year-old from Middletown was escorted to New Haven Superior Court earlier this morning. Clark made a plea deal in the case 
and is expected to receive 45 years behind bars for the killing of Annie Lay. Her family also arrived at the courthouse this, courthouse this morning. About 10 members of her family have traveled from Placerville, California. Her fiance will also be here. They all want to be in the courtroom today to see justice done. Lay's fiance has also never spoken publicly about what he went through, and it is not clear if he will address the court today. But other members of her family will be making victim impact statements. The Yale grad student was last seen back in September of 2009 and was found stuffed inside a laboratory wall on what would have been her wedding day. Raymond Clark is scheduled for release in 2053 when he would be 68 years old. Raymond's father, Raymond Clark II, read a statement outside of the courthouse. Ray has expressed extreme remorse from the very beginning. I can't tell you how many times he sobbed uncontrollably, telling me how sorry he is, telling me how his heart is tortured by the reality that he caused the death of Annie. He said that the family is proud of Ray for taking responsibility for his actions and pleading guilty. The attorney who represents Annie's family said, the family is satisfied that justice was done. And the most important thing for the Lay family is to see Raymond Clark sent to jail for the better part of his adult life. Through all the legal proceedings, Raymond Clark never once offered up a reason for the murder. So we'll never really know why he did what he did. It really does seem completely senseless and a promising life was taken way too soon. Annie had her whole life ahead of her. She was only five days away from marrying the love of her life and only a couple months away from graduating with a doctorate degree she had worked so hard for. Her murder happened over 10 years ago now, and I can't help but wonder where she would be in her life, where she would be in her career, what research she would be doing, and what lives she would be changing. Thank you so much for watching, guys. That's all I have for today. Please let me know what you think about this case in the comment section below, and I will see you next time.